am happy to introduce Dr. Fatimi from Kennedy Krieger, who's going to be leading this panel. And also joining us is Katie Becker, a nurse practitioner from MassGen, Chris Porter from Trevere Therapeutics, and Dr. Smith Fine, also from Kennedy Krieger. Welcome all, and thank you for joining us this very relevant topic. Thank you, Miranda. Thanks for unmuting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be unmuted, but it's also a pleasure to be at this conference. I'm a little online. I wish we can see each other next year. So um, this is really uh, 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 essentially realizing sometimes that when you are facing a major challenge in life, that challenge can be turned into an opportunity. And I think that's exactly what happened here in terms of telehealth. You know, telehealth is nothing new. It's been going on for, for decades. People have been doing efforts in that regard for many years. And, and Katie's going to talk a little more about the history of it. Um, but the challenge we've had is that um, the, the payers would not want us to do that, uh, nor the regulatory agencies. And um, we, you know, had to bring in people for minute things because otherwise we won't be able to um, bill for that activity or have uh, legal issues. So, so when the pandemic happened mid March, um, there was a there was a ruling, a federal ruling that basically permitted us to actually bill for this activity. And we've had a struggle ever since with the many states because each state, you know, you thought newborn screen is crazy, <laughs> medical license reports are crazy. Uh, so every state has their own ruling, the rigidity. It's um, some laws were written, you know, 200 years ago with these medical licensing boards, and um, and and they are again, they are still slow in adapting to this new world that is rapidly, rapidly changing. But uh, you know, I think it just was a pivoting point, and so we were able to to massively scale up. Almost, I, I would think probably every healthcare organization was massively scaling up towards telehealth, which is good for rare diseases because that's exactly what we need. You know, we talked in the morning about how the pediatricians do not know how to convey the message. Well, you know, with telehealth, you now have experts across the country or across the world very rapidly within seconds. So anyway, I, I think we're gonna get started with, with Katie. She's gonna talk about the history of telehealth and then their recent clinical activities, how they're doing that at MGH. Um, Katie is a nurse practitioner at MGH and for those who know her and uh, know the MGH program, know that she's the one running the show in Dr. Eichler's clinic. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we're going to go to the other speaker. So Katie, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Did I unmute? Yeah. Can you hear me or no? Yes, you're good. Okay. Okay. So for those of you I haven't met, my name's Katie and um, I work in Boston. And so I was going to start by kind of saying what is telemedicine? Because I think as was pointed out for many of us, telemedicine is kind of this brand new thing. But it's really any way that we use um, technology and electronics to help us with medical care. So that can be as we think of it now over the internet, but also the telephone, um, faxes, and emails. And so Dr. Fatemi kind of stole the surprise here, but I think many of us think telehealth just kind of started um, in 2020, but it actually started in the early 1900s. And so in the beginning, it was um, over the telephone and really transmitting information a very short distance. But I thought when I was researching this, it was interesting that neurology has actually always been at the forefront. And so the very first um, televisits were done um, at the University of Nebraska by neurologists over the phone. And then of course, once we had the internet, the possibilities of telemedicine really opened up. And so we're lucky at Mass General that telehealth um, really started before COVID and before the pandemic. And so the first um, telehealth at Mass General was done in the late 60s and was actually a pulmonologist that was evaluating sick patients via closed circuit TV. But Dr. Schwamm, who is still at Mass General and looks the exact same, I have to say, um, began to think about telemedicine more the way we think of it today in the late 1990s. And so he created this program that was a stroke telehealth program. And really the reason for it was to try and bring um, the academic center to community hospitals. 
And so the goal was for patients who were having an acute stroke, their team could um, video with someone at Mass General and hopefully avoid having to fly the patient to our hospital. And then in 2010, um, Mass General luckily decided to put a lot of money into telehealth. And so we were able to begin virtual visits in 2012 and 2013. And again, the first department was neurology. And so at that time we were allowed to do it because the hospital would pay us. So we would get RVU credit, which is the credits that providers get for seeing patients, even though the insurance wouldn't pay for it because the hospital as a whole felt that this was going to be the future and they wanted to prove that it was a usable form. And so in 2015, the first providers began to, or the first commercial insurances began to pay for this, but we were never limited in who we were allowed to see. And so in 2019, which was just pure luck, I think, they really expanded this to multiple departments. And so at this point, we kind of went from the telehealth being hospital to hospital to it being provider to patient. And then of course, COVID came and overnight this really exploded. Um, and instead of it only being really to bring rural areas to the city, this was um, obviously to try to protect um, the health of both providers and patients. And so now there are three major ways we're using telemedicine. One is still in that original program where it's hospital to hospital, the televisits, which I think is what most of us think of. And then there have been some really creative ways that the hospital is using, especially iPads, to allow providers to have to go into the rooms of patients with COVID less frequently. And so this just gives you a, a snap at um, the percentage of our total clinic volume that we were seeing virtually, and then the amount that we're now seeing. And this is probably, um, as Dr. Fatemi said, all across the US. So fortunately, COVID has really forced or allowed, depending on how you look at it, us to expand our telehealth. And so now instead of it just being one provider calling a patient, we're able to do these interdisciplinary appointments, um, which is really nice. We're able to have patients invite other providers and other family members. Um, so this is helpful for families maybe that have two houses. We can have both parents without them needing to be in the same location. Um, and this has also allowed us to do telehealth for international patients, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, I think around the summer was when we first were able to really reliably have interpreter services be in the virtual visits via video, which makes a huge difference. And of course we can share the MRIs really nicely, um, which is great. And so now we've kind of gone from just an individual to the patient, to the whole care team being able to connect. And so just to speak to the need for this, as Dr. Fatemi, I think, mentioned, you know, we see patients from all over the world because this is a rare disease. So advantages, obviously, um, you don't have to travel. For some of my clinics, I'm seeing the patients way more frequently. So I see them every six to eight weeks sometimes instead of every three to six months because they don't have to drive into the city. There's not as many limitations. It allows us a lot more flexibility. So we've at times um, maybe not been able to get the best exam and been able to add the patient on for just a 10 minute exam during their more awake time. And then um, I think one surprising part maybe is that it's actually increased our ability to collaborate with outside providers. And so we've had multiple appointments where we've been able to have the pediatricians be part of the clinic visit, um, which is, I think going to be so helpful for education, but also, you know, for that individual patient. And so, of course, it's not all um, perfect. In the beginning, there were many, many problems. Um, and so some ways that I think have helped um, is having videos showing patients how to log on to the appointment, how to sign up has been a huge help. And then I think the other part is that many of us thought you couldn't do a neuro exam over video, but really you can. And in some ways, I think the big advantage to this is that the kids are in their home. So they're in their safe place. Um, sometimes you actually, I think, get a better sense of what they do because they're comfortable. You can see them play with their own toys. Um, 
we have lots of them that bring us their own art. They show it to us, they show us our homework. Um, and so there are lots of ways to make it work. And so these are, you know, seeing tummy times, you can really assess head control and then fine motor skills with the Legos. And then this is an international patient. So one of the things we can do is we can see international patients as long as they're providers. So this shows you all the people that were part of the appointment. So we have research coordinators, we have the local primary care doctor here. We have the local neurologist, Dr. Eichler, um, and then a physical therapist, all part of this one meeting. Um, and this, I don't actually remember where this patient is. She obviously doesn't have ALD, but it, she's overseas. So there are also some hard parts of telemedicine. And um, one of those hopefully will get better as COVID goes away is that many of us are doing telemedicine from our homes. And so there can be internet issues. I did one clinic in my car when the power went out, which was not ideal. Um, my dog has been probably the bane of Dr. Eichler's existence for the last nine months because she is not well-trained for this. And then there are parts of the neuro exam that are very hard to do. So I think tremor um, or more fine motor Changes are just very hard to tell on video if you're having some cutting in and out. As Dr. Patim, you mentioned reimbursement used to be a problem. That's improved with COVID and we don't really know what will happen to some of that emergency legislation once COVID is over. There are HIPAA concerns people have about internet privacy kind of concerns that I think are well worked through. But as he mentioned, the big one here is licensure and clinical malpractice insurance. And so what providers hospitals are willing um, to cover. And so this especially comes up when we're talking about out-of-state patients. But even if I'm a provider that works in Massachusetts, but my house is in New Hampshire, can I see patients for my house comes up? And so before COVID, there were um, efforts to try to make interstate medical licensures um, so that your licensure could cross. Nursing is even worse, I think, than medicine actually. Um, but there's obviously a very long way to go on this. And so that's it. That was great. It was a great quick overview. Um, why don't we go on with the other speakers and then we come back so we have like maybe a five, 10 minutes because I suspect some of the stuff that people want to ask is going to be discussed. So Next is uh, Chris Porter. I uh, haven't met Chris before, so it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, uh, he's Vice President for Government Affairs as, uh, at Traver Therapeutics. Um, and um, I assume you're going to talk about the policy piece. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, not, not so okay. A little muffled. How about now? Is that better? Perfect. <laughs> okay. I'm really sorry about that, gang. I thought I had it all set up. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Lisa, and everyone at the ALD Alliance. Uh, thank you, doctor, for that, that introduction. Um, uh, as, as he mentioned, I am the uh, Vice President of Government Affairs and Policy at Retrofin. We are a rare disease company based in, in San Diego and, um, and focused wholly and completely on identifying and delivering um, therapies for people living with rare disease. So I wanted to build on Katie's presentation by putting a little finer point on where our policymakers are with respect to telehealth and, uh, and talk a little bit, give you an update on that. And then also, um, you know, tell you what you can do if you wanna to try to get involved either via the AL ALD Alliance or, or any of the organizations uh, that work in rare disease. Uh, you may have, uh, heard my name before associated with Retrofin. It's the same Chris Porter and it's the same company, just has the different name. So it's Trevere. Um, and uh, for anyone who's interested in the 
the root of the name uh, and the path that you see there, Trevir, uh, is from Tractus, meaning the, the path and various truth. So the path of truth, and that's the journey that we all go on as rare disease patients, including myself. I'm a rare disease patient myself. So um, some of this, uh, you know, I can't go back to uh, all the fine work that they did at Mass General but I, uh, in the 60s, but I can go to January last year when, um, you know, the COVID really helped shove um, uh, telehealth forward. Um, so last January was when they had the first public health declaration, and that unleashed a lot of those rules that both uh, the doctor mentioned and, and Katie did that kind of kept reimbursement um, and kept kind of normalizing telehealth. So last January, the public health emergency was declared and that opened up a lot of Medicare reimbursement. That's been continuously um, renewed. And matter of fact, Secretary Azar just last uh, last week, extended the, the public health emergency, and thus all the rules that allow telehealth um, from the Medicare perspective are going to continue for at least another three months. Um, Congress went a little further in March, putting it into statute, uh, a lot of those geographic and originating uh, requirements um, they, they, that was extended. Um, you saw some of the numbers from Katie's presentation about how that how people have kind of really embraced it. Uh, the just in you know that short amount of time in April, you know the Medicare visits went from virtually non-existent to to you know close to half of all Medicare primary care visits via telehealth. Then as the pandemic continued and people got more familiar with it, uh, even Medicaid uh, in July said, "Hey, we've realized now that telehealth is not only important to people living in rural area." But it can be, you know, important to other parts of our care continuing. And of course, as a rare disease company, we, we were hearing that loud and clear from all of our rare disease families that it made a big difference in their lives. So again, uh, Medicare and Medicaid in, in October, from the Medicaid perspective, they updated their toolkit for states to try to help them work through telehealth implementation issues. And then a really important thing happened this past December. Uh, which is that when Congress passed its year-end bill, they actually permanently waived, you know, the requirements that have been talked about, but specifically for mental health services. So this is the first time Congress has permanently opened the door uh, for treatment uh, in one specific area. And there are some rules that are along with it. You know, you have to have at least one person visit in the last six months. Um, but you know, it, it's the first time they've put it in statute that, you know, that we're going to do this. So it's, it's really a, a step forward for all the people that have worked on telehealth over the years. So that's kind of uh, how the pandemic has gone. One thing I wanted to point out, uh, point out, and there are a number of groups that have been working on telehealth over the years. Um, but this summer, for the first time, uh, the rare disease families themselves started to speak up. And in July, there was a, a letter, and again, some of this echoes what, what, what Katie just pointed out, uh, that from a rare family perspective, people started to say, hey, this is incredibly important to us. It's had a positive impact on us, lower stress, you know, better access, um, reduced provider distraction, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of the things that we've heard about. And so it was the rare disease community asking Congress, hey, as things go forward, let's try to keep this for rare families. Um, one big component of that too is the relationship of the caregivers. So to be able to have that meeting, not only with the patient and the primary caregiver, but maybe the other caregivers. Uh, caregiving is such a, um, a, a stress to families living with rare disease that have, being able to have whichever caregiver that the patient might be most comfortable with or multiple ones, it, it's been a, a real big difference. So some of the patient groups also went out of their ways to try to tell, uh, to try to provide leaders on the Hill with some data. Uh, because of the, you know, rare disease, there's, these interactions aren't as numerous, but some of the groups that we work with in kidney disease did their own surveys. And as you can see by the, the result, uh, the results there, they came back and said that their interactions, you know, by and large were just as effective from their perspective 
you know, as it would be as if they're if they were in person. So that was a nice uh, and, and exciting development. So as the year went by and the pandemic uh, continued at the Nord Summit in October, uh, we heard from two leaders in Congress, Congress Congresswoman Robin Kelly uh, and Congressman Mike Thompson uh, had a small breakfast with, with a number of us and some people who've been at, at this conference participated in that. But they wanted to make sure that the rare disease community heard loud and clear that they understood why for the rare disease community, telehealth was particularly important. And then by the end of the year, I mean, you know, I've been I've been around for a while, gang. I've I've not seen a letter like this um, that is so big and so bipartisan done at the end of a session. But uh, Congressman Thompson and Senator Schatz from Hawaii uh, and 48 other members, really on a bipartisan basis, got together. And this wasn't rare specific, but they said, "Hey, we want to make sure." you know, that, that, that access to telehealth continues. So as you can see, um, you know, whether you're a provider, whether you're a rare family, um, whether you're somebody in industry, whatever your role is here, that there's a number of people that are trying to make sure uh, that telehealth uh, can, can, can continue. So let, let me also be clear about the, the challenge that we have ahead. So, if you are um, a staffer on a major committee, like uh, Ways and Means or the Finance Committee, you know, Medicare payment for physician services is literally billions and billions of dollars. And they have lots and lots of data on what you get for an in-person visit. They don't have nearly that much on, um, you know, on, on telehealth. There's some data out there, but to make the kind of sweeping changes, they're gonna need more data. So this is going to be an incremental step, and we're all going to have to work together as a rare disease community to continually make sure that people know that this is important. So as those incremental steps happen, like the one that just happened for, uh, for mental health, that, that the needs of rare disease communities uh, are front and center. So these are a couple things. I just spoke with some of these people yesterday. Uh, Congressman Thompson's going to introduce the bill to, you know, keep the COVID gains, as it were, next week. Uh, they're going to do their bigger telehealth bill next month. Uh, there's a lot of government data that's being created and added. Um, some more of that will come out, and they want to hold hearings on it. Uh, Congresswoman Kelly is also has her legislation, uh, which is to, to look at the gains that we've made in COVID, but also make sure that communities of color are not left out. And so let's study how we can most effectively move telehealth forward, uh, but take into account the needs, uh, take into account special needs. And the last thing I want to point out uh, before I go to my final slide is just say, you know, the, the Biden administration is going to be key on this, friends. Um, as, as Secretary uh, Designate, uh, Becerra comes into office and the lower uh, appointees come, we really don't know where they're going to be on telehealth. Uh, so I think it's important, regardless of your place uh, in our community, to make sure that as they stand up, that we're, you know, working and, and letting them know about uh, the value of telehealth to your, to your family, to your practice, whatever you might be. So what can you do from here? Well, first of all, you can reach out to me anytime, um, but you know if you're feasible, if it's feasible, and you're either a patient group or you have chance of anything that you can do to generate data which documents why telehealth is important, even if it's an informal survey, uh, please, please do that and please share it um, with with your policymakers. And whatever you do, don't underestimate your experience as a caregiver. I just heard this again this week from folks on the Hill, they really want patient testimonials, um, you know, that convey why it's important to you. And don't, again, don't underestimate that what you've gone through is not that important. Uh, it is important and, and make sure that you, you share it with people. And as, you know, as I mentioned, the Biden administration gets up, these new bills are being reintroduced to the new Congress. Let's look for opportunities to advocate of course, the uh, NORD and Every Life and the, and the larger rare disease groups are engaged. Um, but I, I invite you to walk with us so we can continue to, to advance these gains for rare families and be in a place, you know, where, where everybody 
can get access to the care that they need regardless of where they live in the United States. So, so that's it. That's my note. I mean, that's my, uh, my email address. And I, I look forward to talking with the rest of the panel. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, just just point out, I mean, there is uh, certainly a, a series of publications that I think have come out or are about to come out in the last few months on trying to show comparativeness between telehealth and, and regular medicine. And, yeah, and, and so that, I don't know, you probably already know about those, but I'm happy to provide some of those links to you. I think especially in the area of uh, mental health, it is really a dramatic impact, right? Because, you know, when you think about a child with special needs, an autistic child sitting at home, and you, as opposed to trying to bring him into a confined room, you know, through a long car ride to an institution. So there's data on that emerging now that, that I don't know how much politicians rely on data. You know? <laughs> when but, they want to, they do. Yeah. But yeah, let's, let's all work together on that. Thanks, doctor. Yeah. All right, great. Well, well, we'll come back. I think we have, I'm sure there's going to be more discussion points here, but let's have Amina maybe give her talk. So Amina Smith-Fine, she's a neurodevelopmental pediatrician at Kennedy Krieger Institute, part of our local dystrophy team. And we started some work that preceded COVID that Amina started. Um, and it's on a different local dystrophy, but now we turned it on and are using it for AMN. So um, go ahead. Okay. Um, can everybody see my screen? Does it look like the full PowerPoint? Presentation. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm going to just move a couple things around so I can see my Zoom as well. All right. So, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Fatimi. Um, as you mentioned, I'm uh, my name is Amina Smith Fine. I'm a neurologist working in the Moser Center for Leukodystrophies at Kennedy, um, doing uh, research with Ali Fatimi's lab in leukodystrophies. So um, my focus on this panel today is a little bit different from um, the previous two speakers. I'll be mostly just focusing on our experience at Kennedy doing tele-research, um, which is also a very important component of telehealth um, with leukodystrophy patients at their homes. Um, so sort of fortuitously, we, we actually started this work a couple of years ago at Kennedy, um, but now it's especially relevant during the pandemic, uh, where of course the ability to conduct, uh, to continue to, uh, to conduct clinical research safely and remotely is, is absolutely essential. Um, so the data that I'll show you is really what we've accumulated over the past couple of years uh, for a, a leukodystrophy that has pretty similar clinical symptoms to AMN called LBSL. Um, but the exciting news is we also just began enrolling um, AMN patients for a joint project with Mass General and the GLIA Clinical Trials Network, which is essentially applying a lot of these same teleresearch measures uh, to study disease changes in AMN over time. So I'll make sure to, to highlight that. All right. So um, adrenomyeloneuropathy, uh, or AMN, is I'm sure well known to this group. Um, this is the most common type of, uh, of adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, this is basically because all adult males um, who don't have cerebral disease with pathogenic uh, changes in ABCD, ABCD1, and then also more than half of female ALD heterozygotes uh, eventually develop AMN. Um, so the, the key clinical uh, symptoms are weakness and spasticity in the legs, gait instability or ataxia, I'm using those interchangeably this talk, um, bowel and bladder problems, and also peripheral neuropathy causing pain and some sensory problems in the feet and the legs. So AMN uh, progresses very slowly over the decades. Um, and you know, although there's been amazing advances uh, in the treatment of childhood onset cerebral uh, ALD, there's currently no treatment available specific to AMN. Um, but because of the increased awareness due to newborn screening and uh, major advances in basic research, it, uh, now it does appear that a series of different therapeutic options have recently emerged and are uh, on the way to being pushed towards clinical development uh, by advocacy and industry partners. Um, so there's hope on the horizon. Um, however, the, the slow and quite variable rate of disease progression um, in AMN and also the lack of understanding of clinical outcome measures uh, is still hampering our readiness for clinical trials in AMN. Um, and so just for this group who might not be as familiar, uh, an outcome measure is basically a measure that you can test that will reflect, uh, sort of reliably, accurately reflect change in disease, either worsening or improvement. Um, so in clinical trials, the goal is to see if the intervention or the treatment actually improves the outcome measure. And an example of that, what we see, uh, look at in neurologic disorders is walking speed. 
Okay, so, uh, so simply stated, the study objective is to establish clinically meaningful quantitative outcome measures for trials in AMN. Um, and this, this is what I'll be talking about is one aim of a larger collaborative project with um, PIs Ali Fatimi at Kennedy and Florian Eichler at Mass General and the GLIA CTN. Um, so our approach uh, is basically to obtain information about gait and balance using wearable sensors. Um, and so uh, in AMN, we're trying to better capture the pathology that we see, and this is focused especially on the um, spinal cord problems of spinal cord dysfunction. Um, as, as part of our approach, we're performing the assessments during virtual visits at participants' homes. Uh, and the, so many advantages with that. Uh, first of all, increasing participation, just much easier for people to set up a test in their home versus coming into a center uh, that require, might require plane travel, car travel, many miles of travel. Um, so can de decrease travel burden as well as uh, cost and time. And now with the pandemic, um, there's also safety risks associated um, and so the plan is to alternate remote and in-person assessments every six months over the next three years. So what I'll be focusing on over the next few slides is pilot data that we've already obtained using this approach in uh, another rare loop dystrophy known as LBSL. Um, so LBSL or leukoencephalopathy with brainstem and spinal cord involvement and lactate elevation uh, is, is essentially an autosomal recessive disorder uh, caused by mutations in DARS2. The only thing you really need to know about DARS2 is it encodes uh, an enzyme that's very important for proper function of the mitochondria, uh, which are the powerhouses of the cell. So uh, the DARS2 mutations cause uh, negative downstream impacts on energy production by the cells of the brain and the spinal cord, and the white matter is significantly affected um, in the brain and the spinal cord of these patients. So um, the MRI, MRI pattern shows changes in the white matter of the cortex, the cerebellum, uh, the brain stem, and the spinal cord, so th sort of throughout the neuraxis. Um, but importantly, the spinal cord is where there's clinical symptom overlap with AMN, uh, with both disorders eventually causing some spinal cord thinning and dysfunction over time. So clinically, uh, LBSL patients experience gait instability, spasticity, dorsal column dysfunction, and onset of their symptoms can be either in childhood or adulthood. All right. So um, in terms of our measures, uh, we chose the OPAL system of wearable accelerometers for our study. Um, an accelerometer is basically like a super advanced Fitbit. Uh, it's an electronic device that can sense movement, velocity, and orientation in space. Um, and it's, there's a picture shown here, it just sort of can fit easily on the waist, on the hands, or on the feet. Uh, so this, the OPAL system is a portable, pretty user-friendly technology for recording movement in a real world context. Um, and during their development, they, the OPALs were already compared to gold standard equipment that would be seen in a motion analysis lab, such as an electronic walkway um, for, for gait analysis or force play for balance analysis. Uh, analysis. Um, and they've, they essentially found data to be high quality with good validity, meaning that the sensors measure what they're supposed to measure compared to these gold standard tests, uh, and also were found to be highly reliable. Um, so the opals have also been used in other neurologic disorders such as uh, MS, Parkinson's disease, and cerebral palsy, uh, and have been shown to accurately measure even small changes in the dis in disease status. So the system consists of these three uh, watch size battery-based accelerometers. They send a synchronized signal to a sensor through ultra-low power radio frequency waves. Um, and they are placed on the feet and the waist for a series of walking uh, and standing balance tests, which I'll describe. So for our virtual visits at, um, at patients' homes, we send uh, by FedEx a few things, uh, the OPALS kit that has all the components they need, uh, a web camera that uh, is remote controlled, a laptop, um, a device manual that has in a uh, layperson's language everything that the family or the patient needs to set up the equipment. Uh, and then we uh, have basically set up a secure uh, connection uh, over Zoom. So uh, the participant then either in advance of the meeting or if needed, we help them uh, after the Zoom connection, they set up a testing area with a 20 foot walkway for us to view. And this is wherever they find space in their home. It's usually a kitchen, a living room or a hallway. Um, it just needs to be a consistent place for every visit. So uh, the amazing thing is in real time, we're able to, as the study staff, 
uh, to be able to help with the setup, do quality control, and run all the walking and balance tests through a remote connection with the participant. Okay, so for the um, for the walk tests, this is just sort of a, a schematic of the setup, the 22 foot walkway I mentioned in, in participants in two trials. Um, we uh, so so a gait cycle is what it's is what is being measured over the course of the two minute trial, um, and so this is basically the period of the foot's first contact with the ground. So usually that when the heel strikes the ground, um, until the same foot makes contact with the ground again. Um, so the, the opal sensors collect 16 different variables during each gait cycle. So it's a lot of information that we get, and that encompasses all the different phases of where the foot might be positioned in space um, as they're walking. So this is a video of a 10 year old girl with a, a moderate ataxia score. I'll uh, just sort of, hopefully that will play. Yeah, there we go. Just to give you an example of what that gait insta instability looks like, it's pretty subtle. Um, she has a little bit of stumbling and hesitancy, especially with her turns. Okay, so, um, so first, I just wanted to show if a, a brief figure. This is one example of, uh, of one of our walking measures, the stride velocity in meters per second, collected uh, using the sensors in the clinic and then all, uh, remotely for four people. Um, and the averages and the standard deviation values, values are shown. So gray bars are um, the, the stride velocity values collected in the clinic. The black bars are the stride velocity values um, collected at home. And so you can see for each of those four participants that there's really no appreciable difference between the measurements in those two settings. So um, the next couple of slides cover a small part of our walk test data from a group of eight LBSL patients and age and sex match controls. And this is a, a mixed group of both uh, kids and adults. So first of all, the stride length. This, so this is a forward distance traveled by the foot during a gait cycle. So again, that first initial contact of the right foot, for instance, to the next initial contact of the right foot. Um, so a short stride length is a compensation for unsteady gait um, and is it hypothesized for patients with ataxia. Our LBSL patients had a shorter stride length. So the, this is the black circles. So overall, a shorter stride length compared to their age match controls. Um, Next, the time that it took to complete a gait cycle in seconds was slightly longer for the LBSL group versus the uh, controls. And then finally, the LBSL group had a slower stride velocity or walking speed uh, compared to the control group. And according to uh, what's out there in the literature, that, that degree of difference, about 0.1 meters per second, is, is clinically meaningful. Um, so then the, the hallmark of ataxia or gait instability is, is variability. So just a lot of a difference um, uh, over the course of a couple minute walk uh, in terms of how people are stepping. Uh, and this can be estimated by uh, the lateral step variability. So if you think about three consecutive foot placements made by the same foot, so say this is right foot, right foot, right foot, this is the variability of the perpendicular deviations of the middle foot placement from the line connecting the first and third. So kind of how widely they're stepping out from the intended path. Um, and this is a marker for a veering or stumbling gait. So um, as you can see, our LBSL group showed a greater uh, lateral step variability versus controls by a couple centimeters. And this was a significant finding. Okay, so switching gears to our standing balance test, the remote balance test is, uh, consists of four uh, conditions in which we challenge uh, the patients by either removing visual input or narrowing their base of support to make things more challenging. Um, so these are feet apart with eyes open, feet apart with eyes closed, feet together with eyes open or feet together with eyes closed. Um, they do two trials that last 30 seconds each um, and their stance, stance width is standardized with a foot plate. So this just it shows where the basically the opal sensor goes on the waist and it can look at side to side and front to back sway. Um, and then these images, so you have to imagine that we're looking for the top down and there's a tracing that occurs over the 30 seconds. Um, but this figure is showing um, tracings during a trial with feet together and eyes open for a representative patient. Um, and this is data that was collected at this uh, simultaneously standing on the force plate in the lab while we're in the opal waist sensor. And you can see that their sway amplitude um, in both instances covers a similar area. 
Okay, so now these clips uh, represent LBSL patient performance on the balance tests. And I'll just show each of these briefly. So this is feet apart, eyes open, which is really the least challenging condition. Feet Almost apart, done. eyes Less closed. Ten seconds, left. ten seconds left. Feet together, eyes open. And note she has a lot of difficulty with the final condition of feet together with eyes closed. So that's challenging her cerebellar system as well as her sensory system through the spinal cord. And so the plots above um, are basically, are, so on the right is her sway tracing over 30 seconds, looking from the top down. Um, on the left is her, is her age matched uh, control that's healthy. So quite a significant difference between those two young ladies. Okay, and here are the sway plots for the, for the whole control and LBSL uh, groups. Um, so it's a similar pattern really, where you can see the eyes closed conditions. Um, there's, a there's a significantly greater amount of sway and that's quantified uh, below here, um, the sway area. Um, so essentially our interpretation is that the difficulty that uh, LBSL patients have with maintaining their sway is probably reflecting um, sensory problems with the dorsal column uh, pathway in the spinal cord. Uh, so basically the patient has difficulty sensing exactly where their feet and legs are in space. Uh, and based on early data gathered in the lab, we, we think that basically we expect to see a similar pattern uh, in AMN using the wearables. And so we're testing that out next. So future directions uh, for the AMN research study that's just beginning to enroll patients. Uh, for that, we will have re the remote measures, including the OPALS test that I just showed you, the walking and balance, as well as a clinical ataxia scale and uh, an actigraph activity monitor. Uh, so essentially that's another Fitbit type of accelerometer device that uh, would stay on for continuous movement monitoring over the course of a couple of weeks to get uh, sort of a more global idea of, of movement patterns throughout the day and how those change over time. Um, the in-person measures would, would also include the, the OPALS test and the ataxia scale, as well as the Xenomat, which is uh, an electronic walkway and the force plate. Uh, so both of those are gold standard tests for walking and for balance and the Vibratron, which uh, is another test of looking at sensory changes um, more directly. So our timeline of visits scheduled. So this is the, the great thing about uh, remote visits is it basically makes it more feasible for us to see patients on a more regular basis um, than they would if they had to come into clinic uh, each time. So we're able over the next three years to do visits every six months, alternating in-person and remote. Um, and ultimately the goals are first to understand more about AMN disease pathology, um, to establish outcome measures for clinical trials in AMN. Um, and, then the, and then really ultimately, uh, we hope to use the wearables data, components of the neurologic exam, patient reported outcomes and imaging data to create a tool that will help us to predict, first of all, how AMN symptoms progress over time, and second, what might be the eventual response to therapy once it's available. So that's the big picture. All right, thank you. I'll take any questions, I guess, is, uh, with the rest of the panel. Great. Thanks, Amir. You're welcome. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's see what questions we have. I, I saw someone earlier, there were a couple of questions that came in. First one was, do you think telehealth will carry on after COVID? Um, I would say I pray so. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it has to. I, I don't. I don't see. Um, you know, and especially now that more research studies are embracing it as well. I, we're using it for screening for our TASACS gene therapy study. I, and we had already seen payers starting to come on board pre-COVID. So. Yeah, I would certainly agree. It's it's here to stay. I think you know the the extent that it gets. Uh, adopted quickly will really be up to um, our government to be able to resolve these major dollar issues uh, about in-person versus telehealth visits and what they're willing to reimburse for. So in a lot of ways, you know, to what Katie said, the commercial side is kind of leading that charge. 
Um, so we, we all collectively have a voice to continue to let them know that it's important. We want them to solve that problem sooner rather than later. So, uh, hi, Dr. Iglesias from Colombia. Uh, one question about what you were saying about, you know, eventually convincing the government about this. I would say probably, I don't know if there's any data out there, but what is the actual dollars that had been spent since March until now fighting COVID and everything attached to that? And how much money we have been spending bringing the patients to the hospital and getting sick? So I would say at the end of the day, if do they want to do actual hard math here, they're going to find a huge gap. I mean, I completely agree with you and your assessment. I mean, for us, it's been working very well. It's an asset for the patients. It's an asset for us. It has been wonderful. And for follow-ups, especially, is is, is, is is extremely efficient. But it's saving, you know, a lot of money because we are not bringing people to the hospital. We had less staff working in the hospital. It's much easier to control everything. So, and this thing with the COVID is going to take probably another year to be fully controlled. So, I think one argument that might be brought to the legislators is okay, listen, guys, when you do your budget, put this in the scale and see, you know, how much money, because that will be a powerful argument to convince the payers to pay. Because if they have to pay for all the people that gets admitted, all the money is going to be spent, all this is going to fire back to them because they're going to need to pay these bills. So, I mean, we have to be kind of creative here and see, you know, how we can also prove that even, you know, from the pure dollar thing, this is actually a good idea. Yeah, if I if I could just add to that, and, and I don't want to jump on any of my, my clinical colleagues here, uh, but the Everlife Foundation, um, yeah, first of all, you're exactly right. And the Everlife Foundation is releasing um, in later this spring, uh, the first ever study of the indirect costs of rare disease. Mm -hmm. So they working with the Lewin group, um, there's a study in the work that has actually done an extensive survey with economic modeling that for the first time we're gonna have actual data which, which points to exactly what you just said, that the cost of the caregiving, the cost of the transportation, you know, all those things that is largely invisible to a lot of policymakers and invisible to the folks that do the numbering, the numbers about traditional kind of medical or uh, patient healthcare system interactions. Uh, we're gonna have actual data on that. And everybody who's attending the conference should be able to be able to use the results of that study in some measure. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to put you in touch with the folks at Every Life, but that will be coming out later this spring. And it's, it's really a monumental step in trying to document the burden, the economic burden of people living with rare disease. I think there's another question that's probably best for. Yes, yes, yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if um, if Dr. Fatimi was going to uh, reemphasize the questions, but uh, I think it's from um, Rachel Salzman. Uh, so she says, to be provocative, why not have your AMN study uh, be conducted 75% or 100% remotely? Can this approach help us have more natural history studies? So yeah, that's a great question. It's provocative in a good way. Um, to, to, so essentially the, 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 the little bit, the snippet of research that I showed you from LBSL, this other leukodystrophy, that is a natural history study that is 100% remote. Um, sort of practically with the AMN study that's, that's just beginning, um, well, a couple of things. Uh, first, we haven't yet had the opportunity to do validation of using um, the wearables for, for gait and balance assessments to validate those against the gold standard measures in the motion analysis lab. So we don't necessarily have to do that over three years, but at least we need a, you know, there should be, um, you know, at least a period of time where we're doing that comparison specifically for this, for this disease, because it hasn't been done before. Um, the second thing is that we are, uh, there's MRI imaging uh, studies planned. So, uh, you know, having, you know, a, a big component of this is going to be um, doing 
the patients are coming in every year anyway for clinic visits. And so we're doing the motion analysis lab work, we're doing the MRI imaging, and then every six months to help relieve the burden, incorporating those remote assessments. And so eventually you might imagine a time where you know, we will be less dependent on those in-person measures, but at least up front, we're, we still need them. And doc, Dr. Fatimi might also weigh in there. But we yeah, have when think. Dr. Fatimi gets that remote MRI. <laughs> I'll be very yeah. impressed. Only we can figure out how to do that. <laughs> that would solve a lot of trouble. <laughs> But, but, but what you could potentially do is to get an MRI locally in Arkansas and then still connect to the expert in Boston, right? So that's the, that's the, the beauty of the, this. Um, I wonder whether, um, uh, oh, I see additional questions, so never mind. Um, it says, do you account for compensatory associated reactions in the sway and gait studies? I noticed that the subject's arms were by her side in the sway study as opposed to crossed on her chest which I believe is the standard. It would be interesting to compare arm position, although this subject sways uh, significant. It makes make pick up on earlier involvement if the person is stabilizing proximally. Uh, that's, let's see, sorry, that's a good question. Um, yeah, this is actually something that I've, that we have talked about with um, one of the physical therapists on our study, Jen Keller. Um, we might end up actually trying to do this in a group of AMN patients. Um, like you said, do, doing a comparison of the crossed arms versus the, um, uh, the at the sides. So actually the, um, the opals, so crossed arms I think is what is typically done in the lab. Um, the opals instructions are actually for the, for the arms to be at the side. So we, we basically went with what was um, recommended um, that for the OPALS algorithm and for that system. Um, but you're right, we would sort of wanna make sure there wasn't any difference for those arm positions. And the most important thing is that we make sure we're keeping it consistent um, each time throughout the course of our study. Yes, because we know that can be a factor. Sure. I'm wondering if uh, I'm sure um, several of the families here have had telehealth visits and if anybody's willing to share what the pros and cons were from their perspective. Nobody? Go ahead. Julian? Um, we've had them with Florian and Katie and they've gone very well. Um, we obviously would rather be in person and see them and be able to give Katie a good smack if needed, but it's worked really good for us. I mean, um, we, my son Grady's had a, a bunch of telehealth appointments, whether it be with them or his um, teams at Children's. I like them. I mean, you definitely miss that personal connection a little bit more, but we know we'll get back there. But once in a while, I think it definitely shows you that you don't have to be there for every single appointment. But we still feel taken care of when we don't feel like we're missing out or behind in anything. Do you mind to explain more? Is it on your son more uh, are the, the, the issues that you were trying to manage? Are they more with that visit? Was it more mental health in nature, more movement in nature? Um, medical, well, yeah. Grady's, Grady's um, with Florian and Katie, he's follow up. He's two and a half years post transplant, the very successful transplant. And he's doing very well. He hasn't had progression or anything. Um, we're dealing with a lot of um, stubborn GVH issues that we still go in person for. But um, some of the things like we had a really frustration, I guess, is like we had a liver team appointment the other day that we weren't able to do because the connection wasn't working, the right links weren't sent. So there are things like that that are very frustrating. Luckily, the doctor called me and then set it up on her personal Zoom. So we got it rectified. But um, we, the, the appointments that we need to be in person, we've been in person. So um, we actually even got to meet with Molly for um, you know, a second opinion type thing. And I think they've gone really well. I mean, our situation might be a little bit different than others if they need in person, but I mean, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, if it needs to be in person, they make it happen. Okay. If that answered your question, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kathleen Fortin. Yeah. 
Hello. I was just going to say, um, I think most of our appointments um, are fine being telemedicine. Uh, the only exception being um, if we're trying to, so my son, for my son's endocrine appointments, we don't like them to be, we won't accept a telemedicine appointment because we're trying to see if we're really closely trying to measure if he is growth delayed, if he's not. And we had a telemedicine visit where I was taking his, I was weighing and measuring him, which, you know, uh, I, it's not, I'm not the most consistent <laughs> at that. Um, you know, if you want to check my own personal weight against my license, um, I'm a little off there. So um, it was just it, the data points that we were trying to collect in that visit were too far off like we're just inconsistent with what we are comparing them to. So we have switched back for endocrine mm -hmm. um, to coming in in person and just letting the clinic just to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. But otherwise, you know, it works really smooth, more mass general. So uh, they've got this down. It, it, I have to say though, uh, <laughs> it's like so common that you get a kid in the clinic where you look at the two weights from the past visits and that just doesn't make sense. So I think that sort of variability in, uh, in weight, especially in younger children, not your, your son is not that young anymore, but, the, but the, in the really young kids, I mean, it's really hard to get accurate measures. And then you know, one time they did it with the diaper and then without a diaper or whatever, you know, so that's, there's, there's lots of factors that can affect that. So I'm not sure how much better it would be. I guess that's my question. Is it truly better when you do that? in sort of in-person measuring height and weight. And we have talked about blood pressure as well. That's been um, an issue, you know, many times in ADHD medication or somebody who's on steroids, you know, you want to check blood pressure. That's a, that's a tricky one, you know, especially in the really young one. Once you're past 10 years, it's easier, but in the first 10 years of life. So um, one way we've addressed that, um, because I do ADHD two days a week, is to have them go to the pediatrician. So a lot of people are more comfortable going to the pediatrician to get a set of vital signs before their appointment than coming into um, Mass General. I think there was a question about international. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if Kennedy Krieger has a different stance than we do. So I, I can just say that the, the international regulations are super complex. So if you ever come to an attorney and say, what about an international patient? The default answer would be no, no, we're not going to do that um, because they don't want to get into the privacy laws of each country and this and that. Um, so depending on, you know, how big your institution is or your provider's institution is, the harder it may be or not. At, at Kennedy, we are, this is being recorded, so I got to be careful what I say, but we have made exceptions. We think that uh, ethics and uh, compassion come first before law sometimes. So, um, but, but, uh, but we do review each case by case and, you know, um, sometimes there's not much of a choice. Oh, there's more and more questions coming fast now. <laughs> so, uh, and so I think I said this, but so for Mass General, the official policy is that we can do, a, I think it's called a pre-visit if the, uh, an outside provider can't be on the call, which means we can't give medical advice, but we can take in information and we can provide general information. But if the um, either primary care or the neurologist that's local is on the appointment, then we're allowed to do it because we're allowed to give advice to another provider. Now, I don't think we're billing. So it's either private pay or it would just be, we're just uh, yeah. doing yeah. it for free. Yeah. Uh, so Miranda, it's 3 p.m. I think they're supposed to stop for this session, right? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. One last question. Um, what? can you tell families do you have any suggestions on preparing for a telehealth appointment katie do you want to answer that um so i actually think that i don't know if anyone if um people from california are on but they have a really nice handout they give that says like have these toys I think the biggest piece of advice that seems silly is to ask the families to get the vital signs ahead of time um and then, you know, ideally, like have the kid with you is a common 
one now that some schools are back, people don't have the child with them. But otherwise, I think, you know, trying to schedule it around your time, but being in a comfortable area, the website has very specific recommendations. But I think getting the vital signs ahead is probably the biggest one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I like them. I think they're fabulous. And I have to say that in-home therapy in pediatrics has always been better for getting kids to open up faster. And so now being able to do that in other specialties and being able to have kids in their safe place, there are kids that I never knew some of the things they could do, but when they're in their bedroom, all of a sudden they can do so much more. And so I, I think that it's fabulous. Thank you so much, Dr. Fatimi and all of our panelists.